Hello, my name is Charity, some call me Chaz, and today I'm going to be talking about trademarks. Now, you might know me from a few different things, if you, if you know me at all, uh, you might not, and that's completely fine. Hello, it's nice to meet you. You might know me from my Animal Crossing Nancy Drew series, you might know me from my sheet music, you might know me from this Reddit post. So, I made this Reddit post in November last year, when I uncovered Mystery of the Seven Keys trademark. Um, well, the filing for the trademark. So yeah, we're gonna talk about it. First up, disclaimers. I am not a lawyer. I have nothing to do with trademarks at all. This is just a research hobby of mine and I have learned a lot about trademarks in the past few months, but I am certainly not an expert on this and I don't mean to present myself as such. Take everything that I say with a grain of salt. Do your own research if you want to. Let me know your findings in the comments. I also have nothing to do with Her Interactive. I've never had anything to do with Her Interactive. I would say that they don't know I exist, uh, but I'm sure that they were made aware of that Reddit post. So first things first, in case you don't already know, I am going to tell you the difference between a trademark, copyright, and a patent. So a trademark is a word, a phrase, or a logo that a company can decide that it's theirs. Trademarks are also filed so that a company can use it in retail and commerce. Now, a copyright is filed when someone wants to protect their intellectual property in the form of a larger piece of media, something that's larger than a phrase or a logo. So that could be a piece of art, a movie, a game, um, a piece of software that they don't want to patent. So a patent is an invention, so they patent how they made it, so no one else can ever sell anything on the market that resembles and uses the same technology that their patent has. Uh, <laughs> I hope that that was good enough of an explanation. If it wasn't, I'm deeply sorry, uh, but I'm doing the best I can here. Again, I am not a lawyer in the slightest. I, I'm in the dark. Anyway, let's talk about searching for trademarks. So there is a little website called the United States Patent and Trademark Office website, which I frequent. I've been looking at this website since uh, probably August or September last year, um, even before Mr. of the Seven Keys came up. And um, so yeah, so this is how you search on the TESS, uh, which is Trademark Electronic Search System. You want to go to Basic Wordmark Search. We're going to search term for Her Interactive. Combined Wordmark is just words in the title. Serial or registration number is if you already have the information about the trademark, so you can search more specifically. Owner name and address, that's the owner of the trademark. And all, as the name suggests, all of them. But I'm going to search for owner name and address, submit query, and here we go, we have all of the trademarks that Her Interactive has ever filed for. So here's the lowdown on the main page here, over here you've got the serial number. So the process of filing a trademark is you fill out the initial paperwork, it gets filed, you get the serial number with it, and then the trademark office assigns a lawyer to the case. The lawyer decides whether your request for a trademark is valid or not, whether someone else is already using it, whether someone else in the marketplace is selling something that is very, very similar and whether you should be filing for it in the first place or not. And then if they decide that actually it is okay, then you have it registered, at which point you get the registration number. So wordmark, that is just the title. I will get into the different types of wordmark when we go through them. Check status, so TSDR is the different part of the website where you can look at the paperwork that's filed. It's it's more specific than just this page. Um, Live Dead, pretty self-explanatory. Is the trademark active or not? You can have a live trademark and then you don't want to pay the fees anymore for it, um, so you let it lapse and then it's dead. Um, but the live ones, you're paying fees to keep it updated. Classes, I will be talking about this. Um, a little bit more in detail when we start looking at the specific ones. So don't worry about that for a quick second. Now I am going to be talking about all of this in relation to the history of Her Interactive because it's relevant. If you don't know about the history of Her Interactive, one, very interesting subject, very interesting, very enjoyable. Two, go and listen to the regular Nancy Drew podcast. They have an episode about the history of Nancy Drew. I will link it in the description. I'll link everything that I'm talking about in the description. Um, they do such a good job at summarizing the history in like, I think it's an hour and a half or something, and it's just so well written and so well researched and they do give me a small shout out, which um, was super lovely of them, but this genuinely isn't about that, like, they're just that good and I, I love them so much, they're my favorite podcast. <laughs> 
Okay, so go listen to that. But for now, we are going to talk about Shootout at Old Tucson. I'm going to go a little bit more in detail with this one, just so that you can understand how we read a trademark, because um, that is something that's good to know if you're trying to draw your own conclusions about what you're seeing. Yeah, I'm not trying to force my opinions on you, I'm just trying to show you here's what we have, here's what it means, here's what it could mean for the future. So Shootout at Old Tucson and The Last Bounty Hunter were carried over from American Laser Games in 2002 after Her Interactive absorbed their parent company American Laser Games. You'll see that the word mark here is for Shootout at Old Tucson, but it's also for the logo, so it's the stylized text. It is currently cancelled, but it was in international class, so I see, 028. The trademark office has 45 categories of goods and service classification, and so this one is in 028, which is toys and sporting goods. The reason why it's in toys and sporting goods, I believe, is because it was a arcade machine. American Laser Games specialized in arcade machines before they switched over to computer games, and um, I believe that that's what it was. I have looked at a few different games from this era because it is the 90s, and the trademark office does change how they classify things over time. US classes, I've been told that that doesn't matter, that is a remnant from the 1970s, and they are automatically generated at this point, so we're not going to worry about that for any of the listings. Goods and services, now this is written by the legal team or by the people who are filing for the trademark. So interactive video game machines and video game software, again, machines, arcade machines, which is why it's in 028. Um, first use dates, mark drawing code, words, letters, and or numbers in stylized form, serial number, filing date, 1994, current basis. So there are two types of basis. First, you've got current basis and original filing basis. Um, pretty self-explanatory and also 1A and 1B. So 1B means that it is not in use, 1A means that it is in use. So when a company is filing for it and they are projecting a release for the item, they will file it as 1B and then once the item is released, they will file it as 1A. You can change it over time, but if someone is filing for a trademark and they're already selling that particular thing, you can just file it straight to 1A. Registrant, you've got American Laser Games, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and also the last listed owner is Her Interactive because it was transferred over to Her Interactive, which is why we're seeing it now when I search for Her Interactive. Um, Attorney of Records, Scott Warner, he's on most of the legal documents here. It is dead, it's not currently in use, so they have no reason to keep it alive. And cancellation date, again, that's probably just something that has lapsed naturally and not something that they have actively killed. So if we just quickly go over to The Last Bounty Hunter as well, again, it's got the logo here, got the international class 028, which is toys and sporting goods. Again, all very similar. The reason why the cancellation date is so much later than Shootout at Old Tucson is because The Last Bounty Hunter was re-released in 2003, 2009, and 2013 with the Mad Dog McCree games, which are also American Laser Game games. But that's really the only difference that we're looking at here. So now onto the interesting things. I'm going to quickly jump across to Her Interactive for a second. This is the last word mark that is actually a logo. All of the other ones are just plain text. The key signifier here is the ripple design. Now the reason why the Her Interactive word mark here is Her Interactive is because American Laser Games had trademarked Her Interactive and a bunch of other trademarks. And I don't know why this wasn't transferred over when American Laser Games collapsed, but yes. So this one is still live, which you'll see. It has always been in use, got two of the 1As. Goods and Services is for 021, which is Computers and Scientific Apparatus, I believe. It literally just means that it's for computers and computer related things. I'm not going to read the um, goods and services listing for all of them, but I will just go over this one. So interactive video games of virtual reality comprised of computer hardware and software. When they say virtual reality, they don't mean VR as we know it today. It just means an alternate reality to the one that we live in. Um, so all of the Nancy Drew games are classed as virtual reality, even though that's absolutely not how we would think of them today. So this was filed in 2000. 
it was registered in 2002 and that's about all I have to say but we will just quickly jump over to the um, American Laser Games trademarks and I'll just run through these super quick. So we got Last Bounty Hunter game, we've already talked about that, Fender Benders game, Shining Sword game, Night Warden game, Mackenzie and Company, the first Her Interactive game for Her Interactive. I'm assuming that's a potential name for Her Interactive. Her Interactive. Sure she can. Now this is a line of, um, I believe that they were informational DVDs about women's careers in the 90s. I've never actually seen the product itself. I would love to know if anyone has. Mackenzie and Company, Mackenzie and Company. Now quickly, why are there three Mackenzie and Companies? Two of them are for games and one of them is for fiction novels. So I assume that they were planning to have a release of fiction novels if slash when Mackenzie and Company really took off. Orbitac, game, her online, her interactive's first website, for her interactive adventures. Again, I would assume that that's a placeholder name for her interactive. Madison High, which is the high school from Mackenzie and Company. Games for her. Again, probably another placeholder name. American Laser Games. This is American Laser Games. Fast Draw Showdown. Game. Mesa. Game. Rocket Ball. Game. Mad Dog McCree. Game. And Shoot Out at Old Chuson. Game. So, that was the rapid fire round of that. Let's go back to the trademarks that we know and love. For girls who aren't afraid of a mouse. Now this was Her Interactive's first ever slogan. If you ask me, it was their best slogan. And you know, I understand that they wanted to change it to make it more inclusive of the boys. Um, but it's really the perfect slogan because computer mouse, brilliant. I don't really have all that much to say about this one, but it is dead. The Cody Capers and Cody. I'm going to talk about these two in conjunction. These were filed as part of the Cody Capers, Cody Pops the Case. It is filed under IC09, which is again, computers, um, which makes sense because it was a downloadable game for the computer. They filed this trademark about two months before the launch of the Cody Cavers, so they probably would have been doing advertisements by then. This was their first casual game and their first non-Nancy Drew game since The Vampire Diaries in 1996. It is currently dead. Um, again, that was probably just because of um, it lapsed and they didn't have any reason to keep it going. And the Cody one is very similar. Dossier. So Nancy Drew Dossier was a series of two games. It was meant to be three. It was two games, Lights, Camera, Curses, and Resorting to Danger. Um, they made this after the Cody Capers uh, and it sadly did not continue um, past 2009. This trademark was filed about three months before the launch of Lights, Camera, Curses. Um, again, they would have been doing promo for it, so it was a good time to be filing that trademark. Again, computer game, it is dead. Now, the interesting thing is that Her Interactive still has dossier on the bottom of their website amongst the trademarks they have listed there. I assume it's fine, but I do think it's a bit odd that they're listing a dead trademark there. None of my business, quite frankly. None of this is my business, to be honest. <laughs> the Mystery Game Company. So Her Interactive used the Mystery Game Company as a temporary slogan for a couple of years. They did have it on their letterheads. Um, it wasn't really a big thing like for Girls Who Aren't Afraid of a Mouse or Dare to Play. This one is filed under IC009, which is computers, and also IC041. So 041 is for educational media. So they can use the Mystery Game Company as something that they use in education as well as computer games. Um, you will see 041 pop up again, but I will remind you of it. This one is dead because there was a little bit of a dispute in the trademark filing. So when you file the trademark and it gets assigned to the lawyer, the lawyer decides whether it's a valid claim that you are the mystery game company. Um, and there was a little bit of a dispute on that. I don't believe that this ever was registered, which is another reason why they changed to Dare to Play. And speaking of, here is Dare to Play. So we've got two different listings. You can see here that one is for 009, which is games and 041, which is education. Um, these ones are still active. It is still the company slogan to this day. It was also the name of one of the Her Interactive blogs way back when. Play the book, Mobile Mysteries, Play the Story, and Portable Sleuth. Now, I'm going to be talking about all of these at the same time, just 
because I can. Um, they're all very similar to each other. They're all filed between January 2010 and January of 2011, so a pretty short span of time. Mobile Mystery Shadow Ranch was released in February of 2011, and they didn't really use Portable Sleuth or play the book in their advertising for it. It was mostly just Mobile Mysteries, which was the name of the series, and Play the Story, which they used in a lot of their marketing. All of these trademarks are dead currently, but yeah, so that's that's the deal with those. <laughs> Now here's where we get into a bit of unknown territory. We've got Detect Divas, which honestly reminds me of this picture of the Powerpuff Girls. Now um, this was never used. You can see over here we've got Current Basis 1B. Uh, it was never in use. I've never heard of it before the trademarks. And um, it's also filed in both games and education. Um, so it was probably more of that they were keeping their options open as opposed to doing both at the same time. It was abandoned in 2012, just over a year after it was filed. I wish I knew more about this. I really do, uh, but unfortunately I do not. So then we've got Dog Digs and Dog Tales. These trademarks are also two that I've never heard of as a Her Interactive fan. They were also never used. They were both also filed for games and education. They were also both abandoned just a couple of years after their filing. Now. This period of time that these were filed was when Megan Geiser made her switch from CEO to Chief Creative Strategy Officer, so she was focusing a lot more on new ventures for the company. Um, so I assume that these were her kind of thing that she was working on. See, my question is, how far along in a project are you when you decide to trademark? Because, like, trademarking's not expensive, but it, you know, like, it does cost money. And I just find it very strange that you would file trademarks on something that you don't really intend to use or you don't end up using. I have heard people say that it is um, a way that people can s try to secure funding from board members or investors, um, you know, to try and sell the product a bit more. So maybe that's all it is. Uh, but. I worry that, um, you know, Detectivas, Dog Digs and Dog Tales will forever be a mystery. Focal. So Focal is her interactive's little known social media app that they launched in, I think it was late 2013, early 2014. This was filed in March 2014 after the company had already launched Focal in use for computer programs. My understanding of Focal is that it would compile your news feeds from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and kind of bring it all into a central Focal location. Didn't do too well. Stuart Mulder left the company, you know, just a couple months after launch, and uh, it shut down basically immediately after he left, as far as I can tell. Now, codes and clues. This one is filed only as an educational media, so it's in 041. It's not under 009. Um, and you can see that here in the Goods and Services, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, STEM, Educational and Entertainment Initiative, in which students use computer programming skills and gaming to solve mysteries, namely providing real-time role-playing computer games for others via global and local area computer networks. So there's just a couple of things I want to talk about with this. So the trademark for this was filed in January of 2015. It was more or less approved in April of 2015. The product was announced to us, the public, in December 2015, 11 months after they had filed it, and then the app was actually released in May of 2016. So there was a pretty decent chunk of time between filing and release of the product. The wording is different for the goods and services. When it was originally filed, it only had STEM educational and entertainment initiative in which students use computer programming skills and gaming to solve mysteries. Uh, I didn't have the rest of it, which doesn't sound quite as legally to me, um, like it doesn't feel like it was written by a lawyer. And on, so on the paperwork that you can view via DSDR, you can see who pays for the trademarks. Um, like I said, it is a paid process. It's like not expensive, but it's, you know, it is still money. Um, and in every single other document that Her Interactive has filed, the legal costs were paid by their lawyers. However, the Coats and Clues trademark was paid for by Penny Milliken herself. Uh, so I... Now this is speculation. Don't take what I say as gospel here. Uh, but 
with the rushed sounding original filing goods and services spiel and the fact that it was paid for by Penny Milliken herself, I do kind of wonder if this was done to secure funding and if it was done in a rush because that's kind of what it feels like. Again, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm just someone who likes to speculate. Uh, but that's, that's what I get from this. Uh, they later on changed it to, you know, include the role-playing local and global computer stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm going to quickly jump up to Hi Kids. Um, so HI Kids, Her Interactive Kids, is the name of the company of Codes and Clues. It is for use in computer programs. This was filed a week before the game's release, uh, and it is currently in use. It is still live, just like Crits and Clues. Uh, but yeah, that's basically all I have to say on Hi Kids. So, Code Puppy. Now, this trademark was filed one day before Crits and Clues was released. It is in reference to the Code Puppy that Nancy and her friends have. It is for use in computer programs. Here's the thing though, it was never granted to her interactive. So again, when they file the trademark, they file it, gets assigned to the lawyer, and the lawyer decides whether the company is fair to use the trademark. Um, is anyone else using it? Turns out when you Google Code Puppy, the game Puppy Adventure from the website Our Code pops up. And I must say it is remarkably similar to Codes and Clues. Obviously there are differences between Puppy Adventure and Codes and Clues. Codes and Clues is a lot more polished. It has um, a storyline. It's got voice acting. It has um, hidden object games. It has a bunch of stuff. Puppy Adventure is just coding, but yes. So that's the tea on that one. One day before release and it wasn't granted. So the final trademark. I am going to show you the entire thing. I'm just going to read it. Mystery of the Seven Keys is what we're looking at. Goods and services, it is a game for computer, scientific apparatus, whatever it is. Downloadable video and computer game programs, recorded video and computer game programs. Therefore, it will be a computer game. Um, standard word mark, no logo. Filing date, October 12th, 2021. Uh, it's not currently in use, which is 1B. Uh, it is currently live. It is pending. So let's just go to the TSDR. So welcome to the TSDR. I check it all the time, and uh, it's basically just a more detailed look at the trademark office and their filing process. It looks slightly more legit than the other website, let's be honest. Um, and here you can see the prosecution history. Application was entered in the trademark thing, and then on November 2nd, the office, the trademark office, supplied more data for it. Um, and then you can also go up here and you can look at the documents. So you can see the word mark, not really all that interesting. And you can also see the application, so you can see all of her interactive details. Um, you can see the attorney's details. You can see who paid for it. Yeah, so basically it's just a legal document explaining what they want from the trademark office. And uh, yeah, I unfortunately don't have too much to say about it. And honestly, we might not have too much to say about it proceeding. But believe you me, I am keeping a close eye on this thing. And if slash when this progresses further, I will be keeping you updated. Now, standard wait times were six months between filing date and lawyer being assigned, but because of um, extenuating circumstances as outlined here, um, they are having longer processing wait times. And I did check this isn't like something that they always have on the website. This is a more recent thing for the past maybe seven or eight months. Um, just our luck, right? So that's what that is. So you might be wondering, where's the Nancy Drew trademark? Why are there all these other trademarks and nothing about Nancy Drew specifically? Like that's what her interactive makes, right? They can't. So Simon & Schuster owns the trademark to Nancy Drew and it's licensed out to her interactive for the purposes of making computer games. Um, but they do have copyrights. So I'm just going to really quickly talk about copyright. Um, so just a reminder, copyright is when they want to protect an entire body of work and it's not just one or two words or a picture. Um, so this is the copyright office. So then we want to search for her interactive and we want it under name of the company. So here we go. You've got game engine for the Nancy Drew series and then you've got all of the names 
of the games there is a second page somewhere. If you're not seeing all the games don't be too alarmed. So these ones that don't say Nancy Drew and they're not all nicely formatted, these ones were done. So the game engine and Secrets Can Kill Through to Danger on Deception Island, they were all put into the system in 2004 and then Shadow Ranch and Blackmoor Manor were added as the games were added to the series. And then in 2021, the company went back and put all of the other games into the copyright database, um, which is where you get the nicely formatted Nancy Drew Secrets and Kill, Nancy Drew Stage Dream for Danger, etc. And it's not just all lowercase um, kind of stuff. They also own uh, some of the American Laser Games titles. You might be asking why don't they patent the engine? Um, I don't know enough about patents to really answer that. My guess would be patenting an engine is a little bit more complicated because you do have to completely outline how the engine works and as you may or may not know the game engine was an ever-evolving thing that the company was constantly working on. So all of them through to Midnight in Salem were put onto the database. The only one really of note here is a uh, Ghost of Thornton Hill. <laughs> Um, this makes me laugh. I think it's really funny. I have looked at other copyrights in the copyright database for different companies, even the Nancy Drew books, and they are rife with spelling errors and punctuation errors and just awful formatting. Uh, so if this is the only one that is bad, like, good job her interactive, honestly. Uh, but yes, Ghost of Thornton Hill does make me smile. So back to the trademarks. I am just going to try and take this time to talk about Mystery of the Seven Keys mostly, um, because... Let's be real, it's the most interesting thing on there, apart from maybe Detectives and Dog Tales and Dog Digs, but those ones are clearly outdated. And maybe just like clear up a few misconceptions that I've seen around. First misconception that I want to talk about, her interactive getting a new lawyer for this trademark. That is false. Claire Hawkins, who is listed on the Mystery of the Seven Keys trademark, while she is not the primary lawyer for the other trademarks, her name is listed in the legal documents in many of the other trademarks. She has been working with Foster Garvey, previously called Garvey Schubert and Bearer, for a long time. I think I've tracked her back as far as seven years or something. Not a new legal team. Same people, just someone else is taking the lead. And good for her. Is this going to be something other than a PC game? From the trademark listing, I would say that it's going to be at least a PC game. Whether it gets supported to other consoles, I don't know, but it does definitely say computer game on the trademark filing. So that's a good thing. Do I think it's going to be a VR game? I don't know. I personally think that there needs to be major changes in the VR industry before we can really properly accommodate an Nancy Drew game for it. Mostly talking about motion sickness and um, interpupillary distance because women tend to have smaller interpupillary distance as opposed to men. VR headsets being incorrectly calibrated for women's faces is a big reason why you hear about more women being motion sick by VR. Um, it's just that the headsets are not calibrated for their faces. Of course, I think that men with large heads have the same issue. It, it just isn't able to be calibrated far enough to each side. Um, so I do think that if her interactive were to make a VR game and the market doesn't start to cater to headsets made for people with smaller faces, uh, like yours truly, then I think that it's going to be a bit of a flop because people aren't going to play a game that makes them feel sick. Just my thoughts. Now, um, is this the title of the new Nancy Drew game? It obviously doesn't say Nancy Drew on there, which they're not allowed to do because Nancy Drew is not owned by her interactive. It would have to be copyrighted as such, but it wouldn't be copyrighted until they make the full game. And, um, so the deal is that they obviously haven't copyrighted any of the previous Nancy Drew titles. Maybe they could have, I don't know, because a lot of the titles are based off books. Now, do I think that Mystery of the Seven Keys is the title of the new Nancy Drew game? I hope so, but I am not actually convinced that it is. I think that it could either be a completely new venture or a new series. So if we look at the previous trademarks, we can see series titles that they have trademarked. So you've got Cody and the Cody Capers. So the Cody Capers was not actually the title of the game. The game was called Cody Pops the Case. It was only one game in the series, but it could have been more. Um, they just didn't decide to go in that direction. Dossier, that 
was again another series. You had Lights, Camera, Curses, and Resort to Danger. You got Mobile Mysteries, which was only one game, but they did intend to release Castle Finster, but I guess Shadow Ranch didn't take off as well as they had hoped, so Castle Finster got shelved. And then you've got Codes and Clues. You might be saying again, there was only one Codes and Clues game, what are you talking about? Well, the story within Codes and Clues is actually called Trouble at the Tech Fair. I honestly believe that there would have been a sequel to Codes and Clues if the company who made Codes and Clues didn't go under. Uh, so they went under in the same month that Codes and Clues was launched, so her interactive would have had to find a new team to work with and maybe they just decided to cut their losses. My absolute wishful thinking is that Mystery of the Seven Keys would be seven games, taking us from game 34 to game 40, a nice round number, seven games, each with their own storyline but having a more overarching storyline in addition to it. We have seen more overarching storylines in the Nancy Drew series in the later part of the series. So you've got Nancy and Deirdre's friendship, or lack thereof in the earlier games. Um, you've got whatever's going on with the Hardy Boys and the detective agency. Um, you've got relationship drama with Ned. Like, you've got all of these little stories that are within the Nancy Drew universe that they have really been expounding upon. And I know that things are different at Her Interactive now, but I do think that it would be fun to kind of continue these storylines in a different way or introduce new storylines and I think if you have a mystery of the seven keys maybe you collect a different key in each game and then at the end of it there's some big I don't know what um people have been talking about maybe this is uh something to do with ransom of the seven ships I do think that of the seven is maybe a bit of a stretch I am doubtful that they would do anything to do with ransom of the seven ships because they did take it off the market uh, because of racist content and I think that it's a bit of a blemish on the record at the moment and I think that it would be unwise if they continued with a storyline from a game that no one can play if you're a new player. Um, I have it on hard copy but you can't buy that on Steam. Now I do honestly think that if Her Interactive had remained the same, had the same team, two games a year production cycle then game 34 would have had something to do with Ransom of the Seven Ships. I have my own theories about that and look if you want me to talk about it I'm happy to do so but that requires a separate video so if you want that leave a comment. If no one comments I won't make the video. Um, but <laughs> yeah I just think that it's unlikely that we're going to see anything to do with Ransom of the Seven Ships given the nature of everything right now. I do think it still could be one game but yeah, it just doesn't fit the pattern, I guess, is what I'm saying. I do kind of wonder if having seven games to have in a lineup to say, hey fans, we're doing seven new games, I do wonder if that would actually save the company. Hopefully Her Interactive has learnt a lot from Midnight in Salem. The reviews from Midnight in Salem were not all that flash, but I think that if people have something to look forward to, then that might just keep the fans alive for a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, who knows. Speaking of Her Interactive, or in this case previous Her Interactive employees, Story Retold, who you might know a little bit better as Little Jackalope, two days after I made my Reddit post about Mystery of the Seven Keys, she released a YouTube video on her channel about how Her Interactive used to title their Nancy Drew game. It's more or less her just reading an Amish Sleuth blog post. Um, but she does emphasize that she cannot say anything due to her NDA um, and given the topic of conversation in that week I do think that is interesting that she made that video. Do I personally think that the use of mystery in the title is a, you know something groundbreaking? We've never had mystery in the title of a Nancy Drew game before. Um, no. To be honest, I think that we are really overdue for a title with mystery in it. I think that it really calls back to a lot of the old Nancy Drew books uh, of the 56 in the first original Nancy Drew Mystery Stories series. Ten of them were titled with Mystery At or Mystery Of, so I do think that it is overdue, but I also think that it might be a way for her interactive to kind of call back to the original books and get a, just like a dash more goodwill with fans by calling on that nostalgia. Now. When are we going to see updates with this trademark? Great question. Hopefully any day now, um, but nothing's going to happen until we get a lawyer and 
the lawyer is overdue, but there are longer processing wait times, as I, as I mentioned. And given how the company handled the Codes and Clues trademark, I wouldn't be surprised if they're not going to announce anything until the trademark has been assigned to a lawyer and basically everything's as good as gold. With the structure that they release information in now, that kind of reinforces it. Until they have something concrete, they wouldn't want to talk about it. It's not listed on their website currently with the other trademarks, just as Codes and Clues wasn't listed with the trademarks until they announced it in December. Yeah, so we might be in for a bit of a long wait, but I mean, it's already been months and months since I discovered it, since this thing was filed. Uh, and you know, we're still hanging in there, I guess, trying to remain optimistic, but you know, it's, it is a little bit hard, uh, especially when we don't have anything concrete except for a couple of legal documents. I will be remaining on Trademark Watch. If you would like to keep up with me on Instagram, I will be talking about it there if and when anything happens. I'm sure that if anything major happens, you will be hearing about it. I hope this video was at least a little bit informative. If you have questions, please leave me a comment. I will try my best to answer it. And until then, I hope you have a great day and I will hopefully catch you next time. Bye.